Hiya, and welcome back to Far Beyond the World. The game that teaches us that... We're always going to simp for the... For insert hot man here. Always. Anyways, let's just hop right in. Listen, trees aside, this is a... This is a marvelous waste of time. Are we really going to pretend like we're just having a dinner party? Dear me, not this again. Hang on, let me... I'm never going to be happy with the placement of my, of my microphone. I'm never going to be happy with it. Dear me, not this again. What else would we be having? The Magistrate gives a cautionary nod towards the mage, but it eludes the mayor. We are a rare core. Oh my god, thank you for the raid, hiya. You can't expect us to squander such an opportunity. We need to discuss things. We are mixed company. That precise mixture is exactly what, ne what necessitates this conversation. Ambister. What are we going to do about those damned marauders scurrying about the countryside? Come, love. Now's not the time. Lady Wrist tries to calm him down, but he ignores her. I have farmers at my gate from dusk till dawn, complaining about missing livestock. Those wolves are clearly living off the land. My son is doing whatever he can. But it's not easy to cover several hundred leagues of territory with just a handful of militia. I've been trying to recruit more men, but with soldiers just returning from the war, there aren't many volunteers. We kept young, able bodies far too long from their homes and families. The armor-clad tiger speaks up, and I can now see the family resemblance. Even their stripes align. Then perhaps it's time we consider a call to arms... I mean, this willful incursion must be stopped. I would advise against that. Kane speaks up in a dry tone, and for once, Lady Wrist agrees with someone. So would I. Hysteria is the last thing this country needs. And arming peasants? Really? When was that ever a good idea? She asks mockingly. It's about self-defense and the defense of the realm. I don't know. Um, I have an idea on what it's all about. I have an idea of what it's all about. Because first off, the wolves, they really aren't hurting anything. They're doing their own goddamn thing. And I'm pretty sure he's just complaining about the wolves. I think it's more about power. Like, Lord Mayor, we get it. We get it. At this point, we get it. Your dick gets hard from warfare. Stop making it everyone's problem! Damn! Trust me, dearie. There are far safer... They are far safer behind these walls and unarmed than out there with swords in their paws. As for the realm, it isn't going anywhere, is it? The elegant male narrows his eyes in expression of betrayal. We've discussed this already. You said you understood. Yes, dear. I understand your reasonings. But I never concurred with your idea of arming the peasantry. You do realize that. Once you arm in... Once you arm the unwashed masses, you're not walled off from what's out there. You're walled in with what's in here. I hate to agree. When they when they are all riled up and excited, it's awfully tricky to calm them down. Not to mention they might misplace their frustrations or worse yet, refuse to disarm. Perish the thought. Our people are hardly at the brink of a revolt. The magistrate's son states, but the female just shakes her head. People are hardly anything until they are something. A tipping point oft hidden in plain sight. Irrespective of your reasoning, you would need the cons 
assent to such an action, and I don't see that as likely. We, ha we have petitioned Tygon several times regarding this issue, each plea falling on deaf ears. Well, no, they didn't. The royal mage looks to the mayor defiantly. Your pleas are the main reason why I'm actually here. I'm to assess the situation. The situation is that we have hundreds of foreign wolves scampering about our countryside uncontested. No offense to Arathon's efforts, but the militia is clearly incapable of protecting our land. No offense taken, and I agree. This is beyond our manpower and resources. The armor-clad tiger concedes. Even private retainers join the hunts. And still the wolves slip our net. And those that are caught prove too much for us to handle. Indeed, my own company has surrounded one such band. They would not stand down, so we had no choice but to cut them down. The Jarl nods, breaking off a piece of bread and munching on it. Mad brutes. They see humans and think easy pickings. Well, imagine their shock when they crashed against my vanguard. You battled on the way here? Well, slaughtered, really. When you fought in... Erinor, an undisciplined wolf raid is hardly a challenge. Be it as it may, this is serious. Our roads are no longer safe. Are you quite sure those weren't just local wolves? I've been to Euron before. I can recognize a dire wolf when I see one. He states sternly, bopping his glass towards one of the servants to have it refilled with wine. The superiority in their condescending looks is unmistakable, only matching that of the gold main lions. Besides, they're clearly traveling from the east coast towards the forest. So, what are they doing here? Mercenary bands, or they pose as such. Arathon shrugs. They've been slowly seeping into Tyrann to Tyrann for weeks now. Do you know how many? It's not like we've counted, but considering the volume and frequency of sightings, I'd say 2,000 at the very least. My eyes widen as I hear Rannoch choke on a drink. Seems quite startled at this estimate. This is completely unacceptable! Some of that damned force is recruiting the very bastards we've just beaten into submission. Uh... <laughs> Surely this must be breaking the truce in some way. It doesn't. So far, there haven't been any host direct hostilities. They're trespassing, yes, but at the same time, Turnin is landlocked. How else are they to get there? Finally, someone speaks some sense. Who are we to prevent the tribes from recruiting mercenaries? Those who are caught in the crossfire? The wolves can recruit whomever they please, as long as they leave us out of it. But not our enemies, surely? Even if you wanted to challenge the good nature of the Horde, 2,000 mercenaries is not the hill upon which the peace treaty would die. Especially not with most of our troops completely withdrawn from Euron. Perhaps, but I'm interested to hear what our Wolven guest has to say about all of this. The armor-clad tiger turns to us and Rannoch blinks in confusion. Me? Yes, you. Lord Grocky agrees. Who else would have a better perspective on those developments than the very denizen of Turnin? I don't have opinion. Tigers do as tigers must. It is one of your tribes dragging those damned foreigners in. You must have a suspicion who it is unless it's your very own father, which makes his party a rather distasteful affair. Arathon, you speak of things you do not understand. And the magistrate cuts him off with a soft growl. I told you to stick to the martial affairs and leave the politics to me. If his father stands behind this, then... No. My father not. Rannoch finally speaks up. Vortigern, he employ foreign. And what proof of that do you have? Lady Rist asks, causing Rannoch to shrug. No proof. So, it's just hearsay. I wouldn't say that. The magistrate laughs nervously, trying to mediate, but the Lord Mayor is having none of it. You simply trust this wolf that his clan has nothing to do with it. It's not like that. Magus Tate has letter. Magus Tate has... I elbow Rannoch discreetly, causing my wolf to shut up. The magistrate did say he has not shared this information with anyone yet. Why he keeps it secret, I don't know, but it's not our secret to spill. Letter? What letter? A personal letter from Rannoch's father. It's a plea for trade rights. I blurt out on the fly. It's still just your word. 
It might just be just their word, but I trust it implicitly. I have my reasons, and I assure you that Vortigern is the one behind this whole ordeal. Uh, whatever there's whatever there's dung to deal with, that name pops up like a bad case of unsettled stomach. The mayor grumbles, drawing Magistrate's curious gaze. You've also had a running in with that arrogant wolf. I have received at least a dozen letters of, letters of kind assurances, while at the same time being served an obscene demand to mind my own business. I think we've all received those, although mine contain an outrageous loan request. Needless to say, I used it as kindling for my fireplace. Lord Grocky scoffs in amusement, and Kane yet again looks around the room alarmed. I haven't been informed of that. Oh, look, the royal narc feels left out. Lady Wrist clicks her tongue in a faint chuckle. Welcome to our world, boy. We have no idea what's going on in the capital half the time. And yet, we don't complain. Oh, how's Vortigern viewed in your parts, Ranok? There's been some troubling rumors of tension. I hope I don't need to remind you how unwelcome an escalation would be. He attack our border. We fight foreign fang and claw, kill a dozen. Well, if Turnin is willing to stand up to those brutes, then who are we to stop them? Better yet, let us aid them in ridding the us of this menace before it becomes a real problem. Well, no. Kane raises his head in another protest. Head or hand? Hand in another protest. We can give them all the support, short of direct aid. Tigeron pursues a policy of non-interference, and my instructions were to ensure exactly that. But this is absurd! The Sorcerer King cannot expect to sit here like ducks on a pond during hunting season! In the last war, those lunatics burned down the farmlands from Brill all the way to Lone Watch and sacked our city. And those were turning wolves. Light only knows what those overseas savages are capable of. Warren Wolf sack Grove, kill Sylvan folk. We own no honor. Ranok adds in a serious tone in the gathered exchange worried looks. So, where does your father stand in all this? Father. He summons Howl. The tribe decides soon. Oh, goody. Lady Wrist grimaces tauntingly. And nothing like a bunch of squabbling wolves gathered in one place to make a decision. Might as well throw a fox into a chicken coop and see what comes out of it. Headless chickens, surely. That depends on the chickens. The Jarl tease is clearly challenging the antiquated concept of prey versus predator. It definitely was tested when the wolves tried to take his party head on. Why are we talking about this at a banquet? What does it matter? The other female issues an exasperated sigh, speaking up for the first time in a long while. It matters a lot if the wolves across the border are falling on hard times. After all, hardship breeds strife and strife breeds violence. We've been down that path once before. I'm afraid I must repeat that we are still very much bound by non-interference policy. We shouldn't be, not if it's the against the best interest of turning. BITCH! Aren't the wolves a better judge of that? I finally pipe in, drawing their collective attention. Last time a tiger meddled with their affairs, it resulted in a catastrophe. For wolves, perhaps, to us, not so much. Didn't you just say the entire countryside was pillaged and this very city sacked? The Jarl comes to my aid, chewing slowly on some meat. We've learned our lesson. Strandbart is now well fortified. That's not the fucking point! You know what? No, no, no. That's not the fucking point. The point! They are trying to... You know what? You know what? Mmm. The point they are trying to make is that you are being a complete and total asshat. How does your colon smell because your ass is, your head is so far up your ass, it's, it's right there. How does it smell? Let me know. I'm fucking, mm. The point is, you're fucking around and you're about to find out. Oh my god! 
it's almost as if that phrase exists for a reason. Fuck around, find out. They fucked around once and then they found out. So then they decided to prevent themselves from finding out and they're fucking around again. Guess what? They're going to find out again. All they need is kaboom booms and guess what? Your defenses go down. Defense down. Have none of you fuckers watched Avatar The Last Airbender? Oh my fuck! Mm. Okay, sorry for that rant. Rant is now over. <sighs> We've learned our lesson. Strandbard is now well fortified. Those might not seem like much, but you don't need much to prevent a band of savages from running rampant through your streets. If you want an example of how that's a terrible idea... Seriously, watch Avatar The Last Airbender, specifically the end of book two. Watch the end of book two of Avatar The Last Airbender, and you'll see what good a wall does if someone uses basic fucking reasoning. Perhaps, but even savages, especially when provoked, can learn new tricks. I add sternly. Besides, Strandbard might have walls and towers to protect it, but there's plenty of farms between here and the forest. Your people suffered enough on account of botched politics, while you, fine lords, hid inside your castles. Well said. The magistrate nods, but Lady Wrist simply shakes her head in annoyance. I'm sorry, I'm getting quite confused here. Is human arguing for or against an intervention? Neither, I shrug. I believe the wolves shouldn't be treated as one big monolith of mindless brutes, but rather a collective of various tribes with different goals, ambitions, and levels of development. Turnin is a diverse tapestry of cultures, wolfkin, or otherwise. Finally! Someone says what I've been struggling to convey for many years. So what would you do had you been in our position? In order to have any clear idea of how to deal with your neighbor, you first must understand that there isn't just one neighbor to begin with. I look at Tyrannic, who smiles at me approvingly. Turnin isn't one people. It isn't even six tribes that compose it. There's Sylvan folk and different religious customs all bundled together. Only citizens of Turnin can decide what's best for them. And unless they request direct aid, any interference would be seen as an imperialistic meddling. Like a yeah, how? No. Here, here. True words have never been spoken on the matter. I feel much relieved knowing where the human stands. The noble tigress pats the table, giving me one of her rare approving smiles. Can we, like, not talk about American politics in the chat? Please? It already stresses me out enough. Can we, like, not? I'm not sure how I feel about her, but my misgivings have to wait as the magistrate raises her his cup in our direction. I wholeheartedly agree. Rannock here came on behest of his father to request trade rights, and I was glad to grant them. Not only is it a step in the right direction to restore good relations between our people, but also a shrewd political move. Varrock was always a safeguard against any upheaval, 
Supporting him is just a logical choice. I've gathered that Rannoch here is meant to be not married, but what's the term? Lady Wrist sucks on a spoon, trying to collect her thoughts. Mated? Oh my. The mayor flusters, and the Wrist woman, woman waves her paw at him dismissively. Hush, darling, we both know what you're up to between the, beneath, between the sheets. It's a wonder your wife can walk straight over to so many cubs. Here, here! How the ever-loving fuck... Genuinely, how the fuck did we go from talking about why the wolves should probably be left the fuck alone to Rannoch's sex life? How did we, how did we get here? The other female chuckles, patting the male on his arm encouragingly while Lady Wrist directs her attention to Rannoch. But made it is the right term, right, Lord Rannoch? Yes... He responds awkwardly, and she continues. Mated to... Maeve Darden. Who is that? Is that someone I should be aware of? How are you supposed to oversee what's going on here when you have clearly no idea of the political landscape? The mayor snaps, causing Kane's posture to deflate once again. This is my first time... This is my first assignment. I didn't have the time to... Well, it isn't going great now, is it? The magistrate throws in his own jab and looks at the mage impatiently. Maeve is... Aokane's daughter, and most likely the next chief of Arden. You mean chieftainess? Oh, hush, darling, I can't stand you being sexist. Not this early in the evening. And what does any of this have to do with Rannoch? Kane looks to my wolf with confusion. Do you know anything at all, or is this non-interference policy nonsense just a ploy to mask your blatant ignorance? I... Rannoch is the future chief of Turnin. The magistrate states plainly, and despite having an inkling about this arrangement, having someone else pointed out so crudely finally drives the importance of it home. Your union would bring two tribes together, which currently are flanking Golderin. That should be a perfect deterrent. It's supposed to happen on the Equinox, isn't it? Yes. Renok almost mumbles in embarrassment. He doesn't seem awfully keen at the prospect and sneaks apologetic gazes towards me. A little more than a month away, then. I doubt we'll see much change in such a short span of time. How do you know all of this? I ask, confused as to how th is this even such common knowledge. It's a mark of poor leadership being blind to one's surroundings. We keep tabs on all the goings-on in our vicinity. Anyway, it seems like the matters are well and pot to sort themselves out, and no need to worry. I guess our royal errand boy has trudged all this way up here for nothing. I'm sorry, I have to say I'm quite surprised to see such a curious gathering casually discussing matters of state. The mage blurts out in discomfort, drawing surprised gazes from the other guests. I thought you said you were at court. I was, but at court the courtiers rarely participate in statecraft. Huh, would you look at that? People rarely discuss delicate matters when they have a rat in their midst. That's a little bit uncouth. Lady Wrist smiles, not at all minding the wording despite her weak protest. But true. The Jarl flashes his brows teasingly. Tygon often complains that within the wa palace walls, even the shrubs have ears. <laughs> that he does. You mean his Imperial Majesty, the Sorcerer King. Bro, shut the fuck up. Kane interrupts with a harsh, with a rather harsh and disapproving tone. I mean, Tygon, the Sorcerer King. Yes! The Arl responds indifferently, much to the White Tiger's annoyance. That's a very informal language. You do realize this man has fought beside his majesty. Lord Magister doesn't hide his shock at, Rain at Kane's rebuttal. He is one of his closest friends, in fact. I realize that, but certain form... I'm sorry, I don't believe I caught your name. Lord Grocky finally raises his finger as if he was signaling a waiter. I think you've heard it well enough, good lord, as I've in been introduced already. I was trying not to pay you any mind, but then you persisted in speaking in such an ill-mannered fashion. I thought it only polite to ask. Well then, for your convenience, I shall repeat it. My name is Kane Snowpaw. Snowpaw. Lord Grocky reclines back into his chair, patting his chin and having a quick think. Your name doesn't tell me anything, which means your presence here is nothing more than petty theatrics. Ha! Ah! Ah! 
Get fucked, Kane. He finally sighs, unamused by his own conclusion. Excuse me? We have our matters well in pawn, as, I'm f and as far as I'm aware, we didn't ask for assistance, have we? He poses a question to our host, and the old tiger shakes his head. Not at all. So your sudden arrival, as surprising as it rightfully is, falls slightly flat when it comes to your... uninspiring person. I'm not sure I follow. I don't know who you are, and as I know everyone who matters, you can do the math. Since we didn't ask for an Imperial Errand Boy, I fail to see how any emergency could warrant someone as... Forgive me for my frankness here. Inconsequential. My lord, I assure you I'm anything but inconsequential. Kane responds sternly while Rayok and I exchange confused gazes. There's a lot of tension in this room, and surprisingly, none of it is directed at us. The threat we face to the stability of our realm is real and significant, and it's posed from within. I'm here to ensure smooth and uneventful governance, in which I fail to understand how a lowly banker participates. Your, your mages are astounding. I'll take it as a compliment. Take it as you will. Lord Grocky scoffs dismissively, dipping lips in his goblet. The capital does not want a repetition of what happened last time we meddled in Wolven Affairs. The foreign policy of the Sorcerer King is strict and clearly outlined, and yet I find this it's time to wolf drink water. at your very table! It's time to the mage drink water. twinkles his fingers in Ranok's direction, much to our joint it's surprise. To it doesn't take long for the magistrate to come to our defense. It's time to is drink there water. something wrong with wolves? Oh! Oh! That explains it. He's not trying to prevent meddling. He's just racist. That explains it. He poses a jaded question. Plenty of them lives in our city. But this one doesn't. Let us not pretend as if he's not a foreigner. My word, the audacity of this one is beyond imagining. Lady Risk covers her muzzle in shock, but quickly gets up to her feet. Need I remind you that I've traveled here all the way from Mog Bay. I'm originally from... Kanate of Sunda. You, dear lord, are Bengari or Amori? I'm sorry, I get those two mixed up. She addresses Lord Grocky and the banker smiles. An excellent ear, dear lady. My family comes from Bengaron. And you, your excellency, are not Tigri, but Tiganari, are you not? She continues to address our host this time around. Lakelands? That is so. He nods, drawing a smirk from the female's muzzle, and she joins her hands at her waist in triumph. I have a gift for those things. Spend enough time at the capital, and you'll learn all sorts of accents. This, well, the only native at this table is a kind Lord Mayor, but even his wife hails from the Southern Bank. Correct! And you yourself, judging both by fur and tongue, are clearly from Amaron. She points to the mage with barely hidden disgust. So, do not wave your greasy little fingers around this room, pointing out who's foreign and who's not. We're all children of Avalon here. Here, here. Perhaps I misspoke. Oh, there is no doubt about that. The female shakes her head and her jiggling jewelry seems to add an emphasis as she takes back her seat. I only meant that receiving diplomats from other states infringes on foreign policy. It's not foreign policy if it's just simple commerce. Lord Grocky interjects in annoyance, leaning onto the table and looking right at Rannoch. The wolf came to ask for trade rights, plain and simple. 
Forgive me for repeating myself, but I fail to see what business someone who does not hold any official position in the government could have in this debate. Oh, he did not. <laughs> he did not. Dear Light, is this brash lad going to be that like that the entire evening? Lady Wrist sighs, rubbing her temple and signaling to the servants to refill her goblet. I'm sorry, Lady Wrist, for dragging the conversation down. I didn't expect it to take such a turn. Oh, not at all. She sighs after a mouthful, slowly sinking back into her seat. I do enjoy a verbal spar, especially when I myself have been tapped out and spare the hassle. Forgive me, I think it's best for all of us to mind our respective fields and leave the matters of governance to me and Lord Magistrate. Kane, can you do us a favor and stop speaking out of your ass? You can enjoy this banquet without interfering with Imperial policy. There's no stopping him. The female splays her paws in defeat. It's like watching a runaway card. My dear boy, do not delude yourself with the silly notion of titles and honors. I am a person far removed from that petty world of yours. You didn't answer my question. Because I don't answer to you, boy. My family is running the Imperial Treasury, so in fact, you are on my payroll. I wouldn't see it that way. The mage remains defiant, and I, just like the rest of the guests, observe this exchange in silence. I know you wouldn't. I'll talk up your lack of manners and ignorance to both youth and inexperience with it, which in of itself tells me that this visit of yours is nothing but a farce cooked up by Mo. You mean the Grand Arcanist? I KNOW whom I mean, child! Modura sent you here ill-prepared because she tries to prove herself to not be just that. Ill-prepared for that ridiculously mismatched role she was suddenly thrust into. The Grand Arcanist is more than capable! Oh please, she's barely 35. <clears throat> Lord Grocky interrupts him with a mocking scoff. That's hardly an age of maturity for any self-respecting magister, let alone an arcanist. Isn't she the youngest one in history? Exactly my point. He nods. The child sending other children into the fray. Must we always suffer ignorance at the behest of another new fad sweeping through the court? Enough of that. Let us not degrade imperial officials and question royal appointments. Not in my presence, at least. The Grand Arcanist is beyond reproach. She's second only to the Sorcerer King himself. The Lord Magistrate finally raises up, drawing our collective attention. Lord King may be crass in, an, crass in an unwelcome development, but he's my guest nonetheless. Let's not make him feel out of place more than it's necessary. As you wish, Your Excellency. As for you, boy... I suggest you learn your place. You might be a prized pet at the capital, but here will be US who decide how to tend to our affairs. He states sternly, barely containing a growl. If you, had any, if you have any complaints, you can keep them to yourself and pen a letter to your superiors. And they can deal with mine. I assure you, I do not fear Tygon because he has my confidence. Just as I have his. I wasn't made a magistrate because my turn came about. I've earned this title by diligence and hard work, and I've retained it for a quarter of a century because I choose my advisors well. Nothing you can say to the Sorcerer King could ever... Become my undoing because I, above all else, am, am competent. I know, right? So if you're looking for a scandal to uncover to further... So if you're looking for a scandal to uncover... Fuck! So if you're looking for a scandal to uncover to further advance your career... I'll have to dash those hopes. If I were you, I would worry more about my own failings. I'm not here to chastise or scrutinize you, Your Excellency. I'm merely here to ensure peace. You're talking as if you were about to raise an army and march into that damned forest! His voice raises ever so slightly, causing the mage to wince. So let me say this plain and simple. With our woven friend bearing witness, there is nothing in this world that could force me to march into those woods. Do you hear me? As long as the wolves keep to themselves, so shall we. 
If it's war you're worried about, I'd suggest you keep an eye on Gildiern. Not your own people. Gildy? Gildiren? Well, let's be done with this matter before it spoils our appetite further. Here, here. Lady Wrist slow claps while still holding her chalice. I'd say we have the we leave this rare conversation and enjoy the evening. We're making the other guests feel left out. She bops her chalice towards the human company and the magistrate nods. Agreed. Oh, not at all. Do continue. I find it all quite interesting. Not to mention it's very educational for Finn. Don't mind me either. Chronicle pages are plenty were filled with gatherings such as these. Let's relive them for a change. Ha! <laughs> A chronicle is what I fear. It's enough I have an official narc in my midst. I don't need to add you lot to the list. Besides, as a co collegium wisdom goes, never leave anything in writing. Shrewd is always friend. I follow the same principle, thus I never bothered with reading or writing. But on a serious note, everything discussed here in, in these halls shall remain within them. Isn't that right, Master Dagolin? My quill shall remain inanimate. Good. Wouldn't want to break it now, would we? Damn, he's so smooth. Even when threatening. And the way he keeps fussing over the youth makes my mind wander. The relation seems quite close and intimate, and I have to admit, it does get me slightly flushed. Uh. He keeps embracing and caressing the boy, who for some reason seems flustered by those open advances. They're definitely banging, or perhaps it's the vodka talking. What the fuck? I'm- I'm confused. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that sounds really bad. Ew. I shake off my head in embarrassment. The conversation shifts to local gossip and I decide to relax. Through all this time of idle nibbling at whatever happened to be within my reach, I've gotten quite full. Full and lethargic, I think I'm going to suffer from a food coma if I keep this up. But there's yet one morsel on the table I haven't tried. The small donut balls drizzled with honey and speckled with roasted sesame and pistachios are worth the effort. I extend my hand and pick up two, slowly placing them one by one into my mouth. Isn't isn't Finn actually a child? Isn't he actually a child? Which, ew. Mmm. They're delicious! I've gorged myself like a pig on so many wonderful foods. Piglet, indeed. Even Rannoch seems satisfied, judging by his constantly moving muzzle and a slowly swaying tail. But then I notice Portia, the ever-scurrying servant, give a meaningful nod to her master. The magistrate gets up and claps his paws, rubbing them merrily. Well then, let us have some music, some more wine and spirit to lift ours well into midnight. Here, here. The gathered reply as I notice a scrawny little cat enter the chamber. It's the bard from the inn! Ah, the final guest of the evening has finally arrived. The magistrate splays his arms and bids the cat to join us. I've shamelessly used my position to snatch him from the strand of Bard. It would have been silly to me if I haven't had the famous Flinian minstrel at our table. I know of you. You wrote so many lovely ballads. One of the reasons why I bothered to learn another language. I feel that Tigery translations don't do your work justice. You're very kind, your ladyship. The cat bows deeply, swooshing his hat in front of him. And Lord Grokki, allow me to extend my deepest gratitude for your patronage. Without it, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to travel here. It was always my dream to perform at the Bard, but it was never within my means. Do not mention, it's our pleasure to have you among our midst. Oh, so you do something... So you do something with your money other than collecting it. Admirable. My family always supported the arts. The stranded Bard is our pride and joy. The tiger replies in a dry tone, clearly done with the jabs from the female. Your Excellency, I hope you'll forgive me my boldness, but I have taken upon myself to invite one more person to this gathering. I won't deny this is unexpected, but not entirely unheard of. Who is your plus one? Dame Kiri. She has just arrived at the barn as I was leaving. Lady Wrist chokes on a drink. <laughs> By the light, you are not having us on the Dame Kiri. Indeed. The bard nods, causing the magistrate to wave his paw energetically. 
<laughs> well, in that case, forget my pardon. Hey, somebody thanks for bringing in such an exalted singer to my home. I've heard she performed to the Sorcerer King at Ellen's death anniversary. She brought the man to tears. Seems a bit macabre. And not at all. I'll explain later, dearest. Oh, what joy! I hope it won't be rude of us to expect just a small performance. She nods her chalice in the bard's direction and he shakes his head. I'm sure she'll be delighted too. In fact, on our way here, we've discussed a possible recital. Well then, where is she? The other female looks around in confusion and we all begin to seek her out. Uh, she's waiting at the gate. The bard responds in a somewhat troubled tone, fiddling with his fingers. What on earth for? I'm afraid she wasn't admitted and the guards said she's not on the list. I can't believe my ears. Lady Rith's fur pales by at least a few shades. The world-famous singer is made to stand at the door like a common salesperson. Portia, go now and fetch Dame Curie. Extend all the possible apologies while I come up with a way to compensate her this indignation. The doe bobs obediently and rushes out of the hall, allowing the magistrate to release an exasperated sigh. Honestly, the guards are all muscle but with but half a brain between them. They're just doing their job, father. Unannounced guests should fall under scrutiny. The armor-plated tiger throws in between idle chews of some dried meats and the magistrate sneers. Let's have a dame halted at the door. When do you think the guards have the time to visit Odeon's or the theater? I have no idea who she is, nor what does it really matter. Goodness me! Lady Wrist passed, pats her chest in clear shock and disapproval. Be silent, you fool! It's the truth. Arathon insists. Our job is simple yet demanding, and so is our entertainment. I feel more at home at the broken keg than at the bard. Please don't say such things. What will the guests think? That he's a fine young man with a mind of his own. The bard smiles encouragingly, nodding towards the young tiger. I too find that visiting the rougher establishments can be an enlightening affair. And such a scandalous one, broken keg is not a place for good-natured citizens. If that's the brothel off the turn and gate, isn't it? And how would you know? Lord Grocky winks cheekily and the female blushes. I might be a simple housewife, dear Caius, but I am also a worldly tigress. I always say one must learn the lay of the land. I never travel anywhere without learning of its finest brothels. I know it on good authority that the Broken Keg is one of the best on this side of the Serpentine. My word! Please, don't call it a brothel. It's a public house with a bad reputation. Public houses and brothels are synonymous for a reason, Mr. Goodness me, really, what in Avalon are we talking about? Lady Wrist massages her temples nervously. And to think you're about to bring a dame into our midst. I have no interest in, interest in singers, that's all I'm saying. I said, be silent, you fool! The magistrate snarls angrily, noticing Portia appear in the door with a slender feline in tow. Dame Curie turns out to be a snow leopard with a pale grayish fur. She wears a magnificent bejeweled pearl-white gown speckled with sequins and gems. Ah, there you are. The magistrate spreads his arms. My deepest apologies, Dame Curie, for this regretful situation. Oh, it's quite all right, Your Excellency. It's not the first time I'm invited to a gathering at the last moment. She smiles kindly, to quite a relief of the gathered. I hope you'll forgive us, but I'm afraid we have started without you. That's perfect, actually, as Wylam and I have soup heard up the inn. Besides, I'm not too keen on heavy meals. I'm just glad to be here. At, at least try some of the nibbling bits. Lady Wrist gestures at the table. We would feel poor company if you left us without eating anything at all. Very well, then. I think I'll, I shall be fine with some of those scrumptious-looking canopies and wine. Portia, wine for Dame Curie. The magistrate commands while the new guests take the last two remaining seats, the bard next to the mayor's wife and Dame Curie beside Lady Wrist. It's such a pleasure to have your refined personage to lift up our rather duller crowd. I'm sorry if my company proves inadequate, Lady Wrist. The Jarl just signaling for his cup to be refilled. Oh, not at all, darling, but you are no artist. None of us are, unless you'd insist to count blood spilling, money grabbing, and being born right in art. 
If only indeed. Lord Grocky murmurs, taking a begrudging sip at yet another veiled jab. Did you travel far? Dagolin seizes the opportunity to focus the conversation back on the dame. Not at all. It was a short hop from a coaching station between here and Tigeron. You traveled in your own coach or the companies? Lord Grocky asks to the other hoarder to the utter horror of Lady Wrist, who throws her hands in the air. Perish the thought! Last time I used a mailing carriage, I nearly broke a hip on one of the bumps. No one should travel in those dilapidated wagons. As it happens, the Sorcerer King was kind enough to arrange for the Imperial coach to carry me. That's quite an honor. Lord Kane. Please, do us all a favor and shut up! Shut the fuck up! I'm sure it caused quite a stir at the bard. The magistrate chuckles and the bard quickly seizes the moment to spin their tail with a melodic twang. Indeed. People lined up the entire square thinking it was a member of the royal family visiting. I must have proven such a disappointment. The leopardist says with genuine embarrassment. Nonsense. What are royals good for anyway? Lord Mayor poses playfully. One table less at an already overcrowded inn, while you, they had a true celebrity on stage. Indeed! But how gracious of his majesty to ease our journey. There is a sign of a true royal. You are given an audience, I take it? Not in this occasion, no. Dame Curie shakes her head, causing her elaborate earrings to chime. His majesty was awfully busy. Especially on account of the prince and princesses. There's always a scandal with those three. It tells you a lot about the future of our alliance. We have six troublemakers of our own. Kids will be kids. Well, they shouldn't be. Foolish notions and mischievery are for the common folk, not purple bloods. Mm -hmm. The singer smiles weakly and hums a sound that could be easily interpreted as dismissal or agreement. Anyway... His Majesty extended his deepest apologies, but still lodged me at the palace. Where did you stay? At the waterfront with Lady Luce. It was a short visit, but a pleasant one. Ah, the waterfront is just divine. I've spent many happy hours strolling the gardens and, uh, promenade. Lady Wrist clutches her breast and sighs a heavy sigh of long longing, to which Dame Curie smiles. Same. I've... Worked on a composition there, but it's not quite ready yet. We shan't ask of it, then. The magistrate states and the dame nods gracefully, gratefully. Thank you, Your Excellency. I hope to have it finished the next time I'll visit the capital. Perhaps we could have a private hearing of it then. I shall hold you to it. With the official business concluded and the new guests settled, the conversation devolves into more casual affair. Jarl York spins tales of his exploits, which reach as far back as his affirmative years. He's been gallivanting across the broken isles and the shattered coast as long as he can remember. Always a part of a mercenary band or squiring off some far-off lord. Lady Wrist, not willing to be outdone and dismissed as a well-mannered, well-behaved lady, ra ravels the gathered in the story of her rebellious teen years when she ran off with her mother's jewels. She traveled to a place called Fair Castle and snuck away onto a merchant ship headed for Lion's Reach, which apparently is across the sea in Euron. She managed to remain a stowaway for two days before hunger forced her to reveal herself. Thankfully, she had a title and enough precious gems on her person to bribe the captain to take her across as a passenger instead of in chains. In the Gold Mainlands, she has struck an acquaintance with the White Mains, a prominent lion and leonine family, and apparently committed some unspeakable mischief with their youngest boy and heir. Sheesh, the farmer wasn't joking when he said rich seek adventures out of boredom. After her less than graceful stay, she was sent away packing by Lord Ranar Whitemane, who sent personal guard, ensuring she got safely delivered to her parents. What followed was something amounting to a prison sentence where she was kept under lock and key by her mother until she secured a mat for a match. Apparently, Lord Rist, her intendant and future husband, found her misadventure and moxie admirable, and they are the main reasons why he settled for her. Then it's the Bard's turn to spin his tale, which he seems all too eager to do. He roamed the width and length of Avalon, his nose for adventure as his compass, and the quill a means to fund his travels. At first he wrote sonnets penny for a charge, 
from bustling marketplaces to serene countrysides, but slowly his relentless riding won him fame and fortune. He claims mischief and adventure of those days were what truly fueled his tales. Every encounter, every escapade became a verse in the grand tapestry of my life's work. Bravo! Utterly beautiful! The mayor's wife cl claps enthusiastically and he bows with glee. What about you, Your Excellency? The cat suddenly turns his attention, peering inquisitively into our host. Were you destined for high offices from birth, or was your path here equally winding? Oh, do not worry, I too spent my youth on its follies. I do tell. Lady Wrist purrs with curiosity, but the old male shakes his head. I'm afraid these tales do not belong solely to me. That is how it usually goes. Indeed, however, the disparity of rank demands my utter confidence. Whatever do you mean? The elegant female blinks and the Lord Mayor pipes in. Tygon, he means Tygon. He states plainly. The two of them were a menace in their youth. You think the prince and princesses run amok? Where do you think they got that from? Oh, now I must hear that. Lady Wrist insists, leaning over to the magistrate, but he only bristles playfully. My lips are sealed. I can leave if that's what you're worried about, Your Excellency. Lord Kane offers, and I'm not sure if it's a joke or if he really wants to leave the table. We were rather hostile towards him, but then again, it's not like he wasn't just asking for it. Not at all. The magistrate shakes his head. But I prefer when his majesty tells of our exploits. It preserves the proper form. Besides, he's a far better storyteller than I am. With such an abrupt end to the shared topic, the conversation devolves yet again to localized small talk. I continue nibbling on various foods, looking to Rannoch every now and then to discover him being engrossed in the various conversations taking place. It almost seems he would love to join in, however, his pride stops him from doing so on the account of his lacking in Tigri language skills. The Lord Mayor and Lord Grocky are engrossed in some financial debate, with Caius insisting on a taxation reform in favor of the poor, while the Lord Mayor being strongly against it. I find it both surprising and endearing seeing such a wealthy banker advocating for the lowest of citizenry. But as much as I would like to pitch in, my understanding of their affairs is so limited that I decide to hold my tongue in case I'd make a fool of myself. Kane on our left is engaged with the magistrate's son, both discussing the security of the region and the royal mage trying to wiggle out some more details regarding the intruders. Arathon gives very little, most it's likely on account of the cold water. and suspicious attitude of the remaining guests. It's time to drink water. Then there is a musical troupe and the it's remaining time to human drink party. Water. Master Dagolin discusses the latest melodies water. with the bard and his singer friend. The two felines, despite being themselves ma masters of the field, listen to the man with clear fascination. It's such a stark contrast to what I've witnessed at the Wolven Village, and I can see that Rannoch notices it too. People of different races and different social standing are seated at one table and treat each other, maybe not like literal equals, but as fellow kin deserving modicum of respect. Everyone here is looked at as if they have something valuable to contribute, regardless of their background. What about you? In that tone, Master Dagolin shoots in our direction. What sort of music is enjoyed in Turna nowadays? I look to Rannoch with confusion as I don't feel equipped to answer that question. Music is music. I'm sure there are technical terms to differentiate between styles, but I'm no musician. Upbeat, happy, and ours. We don't listen to foreign. Ah, so tribal then. The man concludes, facing the bard as if to gauge his opinion. I have encountered a turn in wolf once during my tour of Amaron. Oh? Was it the white female with the most exquisite of voices? Dame Kiri pitches in as she puts down her chalice. I remember she had this otherworldly ability to incorporate her actual howl into the lyrics. It was a surreal experience. Indeed, the very same. The cat nods his head in surprise and smiles. I was enchanted. Such a gentle and honorable creature. How you know she turnin'? She told me so when I asked about a tattoo on her cheek. An upturned crescent with a teardrop beneath it. I mutter through a frown of realization and the bard nods again. Indeed. How oh, uncanny. Have you met her as well? No, love. I'm afraid he our friend refers to the mark of the weeping moon. She was banished. Banished? Oh my. Dame Kiri places her gentle paw on her chest and looks at us with worry. What could she have possibly done to deserve such a fate? I don't know. Rannoch's expression falters as he forces the words out of his muzzle. I suggested she should visit Stranded Bard, told her she'd make a name for herself there. But she refused, saying that even in death she would not be found anywhere close to that accursed forest. Can you blame her? 
when her own kin cast her out. The female mutters in a mix of sadness and contempt. At least she's happy in Amaron. There she celebrated like one of their own. What her name be? Rannoch demands, making me think he intends to ask about who this she-wolf might be once we're back. I know he said before that most weeping moons are murderers and thieves, but how many of such lowlifes end up being gentle and inspirational singers? Enid. The bard responds, and it's clear the name tells Rannoch nothing. Well, enough of that. Has everyone had their fill? Yeah, fuck. The magistrate asks, raising up to his feet, and the gathered put down their cups and forks and look at him with gentle nods. Perfect. Let us come through to the gardens and continue the jubilations in a more relaxed and open setting. And as if by a spell, everyone gets up, and I even find myself standing to attention. This tiger commands respect and authority, and with good reason. He's a gracious and a generous host. It would simply be impolite to countermand him in any way. How much is left in this update? Yeah, it has. Back. Is it... Is it enough for another stream? Yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna leave off here tonight. Sorry, I... Yeah. Well, stay safe, have a good night, and I will see you all tomorrow.